There's a specific professional New York hockey team that was eliminated from the playoffs about six days ago now. Uh, anybody want to talk about that? We are Joe. Uh, beginning of the second yep, hour. Joe, so go on the co- on, on cue right there. Joe, thank you for joining us, and I'm sure that this may not be pretty to talk about to begin your uh, segment here on, sp- on Sports Section. Yeah, the floor is uh, yours, Joe. Yeah, it's, it's, listen, I'm, I'm not... I'm not as upset as many people might think over the fact that the Rangers didn't make the playoffs because to be honest with you, it, the expectation probably wasn't for them to make the playoffs considering that it was a very tough division going into this, um, going into this season. Uh, we knew that the East was probably going to be a gauntlet and in a shortened season, 56 games, you know, <clears throat> you know, when you think about the Rangers and the, slow start that they got off to and you know their top players not performing and then losing Panarin for two weeks you know everybody sits there and says oh you know if maybe you don't lose Panarin for two weeks for that leave of absence and Mika Zibanejad gets up and going and he doesn't have two goals in the first 27 games it maybe it'd be a different story but believe me I'm not as upset about it as many people think I think what's really more shocking and upsetting is the fact that the immediate and surprising firings of both John Davidson and Jeff Gorton, especially with the foundation that they built within this team uh, and especially JD specifically, um, you know, just two years on the job, a beloved Ranger, um, you know, first thing I thought about was, you know, his introductory press conference where his first couple of words was dreams really do come true. And he was, you know, on the verge of tears and then, you know, I watched the broadcast the night at the night of when it happened because they did play a game that very night up in Boston. And, you know, Sam Rosen, the longtime broadcaster for the Rangers, is holding back tears on the broadcast because that's a very good friend of his. Um, so definitely shocking and surprising. And then, of course, you try to figure out and try to put the pieces together of why this happened, where James Dolan decided to go full-blown Knicks on the Rangers situation where he put his – knows into this business that he really rarely does. You know, you think back to the days of Glenn Sather, basically Glenn Sather called the shots. Obviously you check in with your owner and stuff, but you know, he kind of left Glenn Sather alone in those situations. So, uh, I mean, look, to just to, to sum that all up, I think a couple of days have passed to let it process for Ranger fans. Obviously it's upsetting, but you know, they're not getting somebody who's worse in Chris Drury because obviously Chris Drury has been highly sought after by a number of teams that he politely declined. And he's really risen through the ranks of the Rangers organization in the six years that he's been in a front office role. And I'm very eager and curious to see what he needs to do. So in essence, the way I pin it and look at it is that, you know, I think really what the truth behind this is. And again, this is just me formulating my own opinion and just kind of reading between the lines of the reports that we've heard that I firmly believe that James Dolan wanted to make a general manager change. And I can understand that because, you know, it's, it's been four years since the letter, you know, they've stockpiled a decent amount of talent. They have a lot of assets. They have draft picks that maybe it's time to now take that next step to where I think that James Dolan wanted to replace the GM. And I think John Davidson said, well, if you're going to think to replace him that I don't agree with, then you're going to have to let me go. And I think that's what wound up happening. And then you tie in the fact that the Knicks success this season probably had him thinking, listen, if the Knicks can turn it around that quickly, I've been patient for four years with the New York Rangers. It's time to now take the next step. And, and one of the quotes he gave the New York post was, I feel like we're missing something. And Chris Drury, I think will be the guy to find it. So um, definitely an emotional, draining week for the Rangers, but good for them that they ended the season on a winning note. There was a lot of, of nonsense to deal with. I think another thing to touch on, too, is Tom Wilson. I mean, the heinous actions starting off the week, throwing Artemi Panarin to the ground, and as a result, he's only fined $5,000. This is a repeat of you, mind, mind you, in so many unsportsmanlike conducts and, you know, flagrant penalties. And the league doesn't think to give him another suspension because playoffs are coming. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, it's interesting for sure. Um, I know. You know, I obviously was very vocal and adamant about the fact that Tom Wilson should have been 
suspended, um, you know, and the Rangers put out a very courageous and bold statement. And of course, that's where everybody thought that, you know, Davidson and Gordon didn't agree with the statement, but that wasn't related to the decisions of the firings and stuff like that. Um, you know, listen, I think they hit it on the head because they're basically saying that the player safety department, who we all know has been really inconsistent with a lot of things. Um, and the fact that they, you know, slap Wilson with a $5,000 fine and granted it wasn't even the, the play of, you know, it wasn't the situation of where he grabbed Panarin's hair and put threw him around like a rag doll. It was for the fact that he sucker punched Pavel Buchnevich while he was on the ground. So it's it's alarming. And then, and then when you have the player safety department, then going out and suspending guys for far less action, it makes you scratch your head. So I think the Rangers were courageous. I think that they hit it it's on the head when, with that statement. And I think that, yeah, George Paros maybe needs to be reevaluated as the head of player safety department because it's an absolute joke that, you know, Tom Wilson, we know, is a repeat offender. And the yeah. fact that he's slapped on the wrist with a fine is just ridiculous. And to be honest with you, then he leaves that game. Then the Rangers responded, which, listen, we know that they're not a tough team, and I think that's going to be something that will definitely be addressed by Chris Drury in this offseason. They start the game, a line brawl, reminiscent of the Rangers-Devils line brawl when Rupp, Stu Bickle, and Pruss went at it at the Garden. You know, So they did that. So I think the Rangers players took matters into their own hands, and I think as a Rangers fan, you had to be really proud of that situation because there were six fights and 100 penalty minutes in the first period. So... um. You know, and then you wonder, and then you wonder though, like, you know, then Tom Wilson leaves the game with an upper body injury. That's basically, you know, him hiding like a coward. And then not for nothing, he gets hit with a knee on knee the the very next game. And good, you know what? Karma comes back to haunt you. And that's exactly what he deserved then. Listen, I'm not wishing any players to get hurt, but you know what? The knee on knee and I'm hoping he's out for the playoffs because he deserved it. Uh, honestly, my thing going back to the Rangers particularly is this. So you get rid of Jeff Gordon, get rid of John Davidson. What do you do with David Quinn? Because I do understand you weren't a guy who really believed they could make playoffs. I did. And frankly, you know, you look at the numbers, look, it'll give two stats. First off, the top 12 teams that scored the most goals in the conference, 11 of those teams made it in. The Rangers are the only one on the outside looking in. They scored more than the Bruins who made it in and the Isles. Isles. They're 5-15 and 15 in one goal game. So you switch three or four of those results, and it's the Rangers in four oh, for a third. I mean, well, with the new of, of uh, Drury coming in, what's David Quinn's future? Because there's a lot of speculation, especially on the fan base, that Quinn is a sitting duck for the moment, and the other shoe's going to drop. I, I think you're probably going to get that answer after tomorrow. Um, tomorrow is when breakup day is happening and all the exit interviews are happening. Um, so I think you're, you're, you know, uh, Drury is going to assess that situation. Um, I know Drury was pretty high on David Quinn as well when that hiring process happened. So, you know, it's definitely going to be interesting to see what they do there. Um, I think this week will be a telling sign. But also you look at Chris Drury and you're like, well, you know, Quinn did a good job, not the greatest. And if this team is ready to take the next step, maybe a little bit more experience has to be out there. And there is, there are quite a number of names that are out there that could intrigue the New York Rangers. Now I know people are starting to connect some dots because today two coaches were let go or mutually parted ways. Rick Tockett of the Arizona Coyotes and John Tortorella of the Columbus Blue Jackets. And it's so funny because, you know, I look on, (laughs) I look on, I look on social media and you see people saying, that they want no part of Tortorella because they know that his handling of young kids really hasn't been the best um, in recent, in, you know, in past seasons. I mean, just look you at know. Columbus this season. Yeah. You know, but um, it, it's definitely going to be interesting. You also have a guy, Gerard Gallant, who I think would probably be the better fit out of the three so far. And then I also know that Mike Babcock is out there, but I honestly think the, <laughs> the, the, the dark cloud, the dark cloud that follows him might not be the right move. So look, I think Chris Drury is in an interesting position. Mike Babcock, but... the only dark cloud that follows him is he coached the Leafs. Well, he was fine when in Detroit. Allegations, but also the other allegations of, you know, the way he former treated players. players and stuff like that. I know that there's been a lot of former players very vocal about how, 
he handled certain situations and things of that nature. So, um, why is that know, stuff it, like always happening in be Toronto? Look, the way I think about it, the way I think about it is if this is what's going to happen, you know, obviously you saw a, a management upheaval this week. Um, I think also you look into the fact that, you know, maybe Drury might want to bring in his own guy and start a training camp and a, and a fresh season, you know, um, with somebody new. Now, Quinn still does have two years on a contract. However, it's not, you know, an expensive contract. So I think the Rangers could afford to, to do that because then, you know, you're saying, all right, we're going to keep with, we're going to stay with you here, but you have a month or two months, whatever the case may be. And then you're changing coaches midway through the year. I think, I think what Drury wants to do is kind of just really take a collective. And he said it in his press conference. He wants to take a collective deep dive into the organization, what they need, what they want to do. Um, so, like I said, I really think by, I want to put my best guess that by Wednesday, we should have an outcome or a fate of David Quinn, because I really think that the Rangers, if they're going to do this, they're going to probably want to act quickly because, you know, things are picking up, you know, the playoffs are starting, but you already only have like two months to prepare for an expansion draft, the regular entry draft and trades and free agency. And the Rangers are going to have some bring that up. to work with because everything is running late in this NHL season. It, the series, regular season is only ending now a month later than it normally does. So, if they want to, and the intention is to do so, start everything normal next year, which means opening in October, training camp in September, this is going to be a very short off season. Yeah, so, it's, it's absolutely going to be a very short off season. So, you know, Drury has a, a lot of work to do in a very small window, but the fact that where the state of the Rangers are as far as talent and assets, I think he's in a great position to make some possible trades. He's in a good position with cap space. You have a couple of contracts coming off the books. You also have some restricted free agents that you're going to have to take care of and all that stuff. So it's really going to be interesting. But I really think what he's going to want to do is address the toughness of this team because we obviously saw it. And, you know, like I said, James Dolan, I think his patience have, has worn out. And I think he wants to kind of accelerate what the Rangers got going. And look, we can sit here and play the what if games because we know that they are finishing the season on a winning note and they made an interesting run. Don't forget. It was only a 56 game season. What could we have saw with an 82 game season? But I also think, and to wrap my portion up because I do have to get out of here, but the, the difference is, and I felt that there were games where the Rangers were not prepared to play and that falls on the coach. Uh, the mental preparation falls on the coach in games like that. You know, when you go back to – and Dave, James Dolan cited it in his in the inter interview with the Post. He was livid after the Islanders basically manhandled the Rangers for two <laughs> games, shut them. them out, yeah. shut them out, and, you know um, – And, you know, and so again, it's not that the right. Isles are a bad team, as we're going to touch on shortly. But, again, this no, is no. game six and seven of the season Listen, you're facing them. You've got to know Rangers, what they're bringing. The Rangers proved that they could play with the Islanders. You know, everybody's high right. and mighty on this Islander team. Yeah, they won against the Devils the other day, but they've been struggling. And I got news for you. I do hope that they get knocked out of the first round just to shut Islander fans up because they had their glory there for a minute because they manhandled the Rangers. And – they're so excited to be going to their third straight postseason. All right, get to about 12 straight postseasons like the Rangers did for a, a 12 out of 13. Then you could come and talk to me. Okay, so honestly, the Islanders are not playing good hockey right now. They are not playing good hockey. True. But like I said, though, they came out in those games against the Rangers wanting it more. And that's the difference I feel as if in a coach, especially at this level. That you need, you know, and that was a critical game for the Rangers because they could have pulled within two points of Boston, if not tie them, and even put some heat on the Islanders, and they didn't do it. And that comes down to preparedness, and that's what I think the difference maker is in with an experienced coach versus a coach coming out of college.